Um, 16 billion of potential projects. Estimated. Yeah, estimated, that's fine, but you know, within a billion or two. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty, I mean, agriculture is two billion a year of the, uh, of the economy in the Grampians region, which is our biggest, just over two billion, our biggest sector. 16, what, over, what kind of period is that over? Uh, obviously, you don't. Uh, that's terrible. It's not working well, is it? No. In fact, should we do it? Then Minister for Resources, um, I think it was Lily D'Ambrosio, and there was a whole heap of, I don't even know, 10 years ago, it was a while ago. Um, and there was um, a whole heap of the, the coal mine companies there, uh, and basically they could see the writing on the wall, uh, and we were talking, we said we were afterwards for drinks, um, and they were talking then about, uh, their head offices talking about slowing down our capital and reducing uh, unnecessary maintenance. Now, what, what that means basically in one of those big processing plants is that uh, they tend to shut down quicker than expected. Right. Um, because, you know, if you are uh, exiting something, you tend not to throw good money in after bad. So, as we've seen... Dare I say coal fired power plants? Um, as, as we're seeing, yeah. um, without talking for, for industry, uh, as you can see around the globe, uh, the estimates of when these coal mines are shutting down, and we're seeing that here, it happens quicker than anyone's expecting. So the clock really is ticking on getting this renewable transition happening sooner rather than later. Yeah, I have to say that there's been a number of statistics and things on slides today that have kind of captured my attention. Um, but Darmac are using that step change data of 2032, so not having any coal-fired power generation potentially in Victoria by 2032, uh, which is one of the potential paths. Um, it's not very far away. No, it's obviously a very different thing to plan for a, a transition that is not just meeting growth, yeah. So, um, but it's also, you know, full transition from an existing supply to a, a completely new model. Uh, you have to replace all your existing infrastructure, more or less, um, plus additional infrastructure for the growth that you're planning. Yeah. So, I'll, I'll put a question to the, to the whole panel. Um, Victoria's economy has traditionally been built on actually cheap energy. Um, essentially, if I put my economist hat on, which I don't get to do very often, um, the, economy, power. Yeah, the economy has essentially, we, we took power and we transformed it into a product. I mean, that's aluminium and that's our entire manufacturing. Um, we seem to have lost that in the last little while. Can we regain that now with the renewable energy zones and, and the opportunity? And I'm looking at you to start. Can we, if we can, we're not using the mic, so you can hold on to it, Emily. Yeah, exactly. I think uh, oh, Carl was mentioned. And yes. This is like a talking oh, stick. <laughs> 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 talking yeah. stick. Yeah. Yeah. Talking yeah. stick. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Like, and so the kids did it. Hopefully, everyone can hear me up the back. But um, I'll mention Alcoa again, although you know yeah. it may not be the best example. But in some ways, that infrastructure has opened up op opportunity for Victoria. However ill-conceived it may seem for that at the time to generate energy from one part of the state and ship it with about 25% losses right to the other part of the state, that has created a framework of transmission infrastructure, yeah. which is obviously broadened now further to that, that now provides the backbone that we're building on with the potential to be able to generate renewable energy from anywhere in the state, and also to be able to build on that backbone with manufacturing. 
And I think looking at the opportunities that renewable hydrogen is also bringing to our state, you know, that is got, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot that we need to explore further and that's part of what we're doing through the um, Business Ready Fund with feasibility studies and um, uh, business cases, looking at how industry might be able to use renewable hydrogen. But the potential for that is for that to be decentralised and for yeah. that to be not just in the major centres, you know, not just, um, you know, in, in the sort of standard known locations where we've had um, sort of that infrastructure, but to be able to spread that benefit right throughout the regions and to be able to generate hydrogen where you might be able to be able to use it locally, so sort of coupling up that renewable energy generation with use both, you know, electrical but also, you know, hydrogen as liquid fuels in industry for heat um, and, uh, and power and uh, as a feedstock. So don't, don't criticise that old car power line too much because it was actually my grandfather who was the Minister for State Development who approved it. So it's the, about the only thing my family's ever done. Um, so taking on that hydrogen angle again, so how does the Hume Hydrogen Project kind of tie into that transition? Sure, I think, you know, as I mentioned, the um, Hume Hydrogen Highway... Because it's not in our region, by the way. It's definitely not in our I've region. I've noticed it. It's definitely yeah. not. It is outside of our region. But what this does, this is the first, this is the busiest freight route um, in Australia between Melbourne and Sydney. Obviously, oh. Melbourne, Melbourne has um, Australia's busiest container port, and there's a lot of road and rail freight that goes from Melbourne then to Sydney, to Adelaide, to, and uh, you know Brisbane and beyond. And there's an entire network, as I mentioned. There's also tying from Adelaide to Brisbane as well, and all parts in between. So the first stage is between Melbourne and Sydney, and Victoria. Government and South Australian Government signed a memorandum of understanding to deliver the Hume Hydrogen Highway. But what we also did was signed a further memorandum of understanding, a tripartite one with Queensland as well, to further build that framework um, sort of up to Brisbane, so Sydney to Brisbane, Melbourne to Brisbane, yep. um, and then with a vision to be able to turn that into an integrated East Coast freight network. And that's where the sort of obviously the western routes come in between uh, between Melbourne and Adelaide, between Adelaide and Sydney, and then creating an entire network infrastructure with refuelling stations and hydrogen fuelled vehicles. So we've very much got um, our eye on that future, and we're very excited to see that actually um, it seems that developers and industries are almost ahead of us on that one. We're hearing about a lot of um, activity in that space. Yeah, and certainly the community's interest, particularly, I guess you've had the EV stuff has, I mean, only a couple of years prior, but it started um, kind of blazing that trail a little bit. Um, Rashika, can I ask you, how do we get local communities to advocate for regulatory change, which is kind of what you're you're talking about. Like that's a yeah, that's a that's a complicated jump, I think. Yeah, well, uh, but it's necessary. Yeah, that's the unfortunate bit. I think I think without that, we're not going to get the kind of proactive regulatory change that we'd all like to see to enable um, some of the more uh, creative or innovative um, projects that we're talking about. And and it's a real big challenge because it stems into cultural change, energy literacy, there's all kinds of you know, um, drivers there. But, but I think it's really important for um, this concept of energy agency is becoming more and more of a, um, uh, I think, you know, people, whether you call it democratization of electricity or energy or you call it distribution, it's, it's energy agency, right? People are making a purchasing decision behind the meter, whether that's an, an industry body or a residential homeowner, and that has, impact on how the network could run, right? And there's a sense of agency in their home or business around how they choose to use energy, um, whether that's self-generated or just trading with neighbors, whatever that looks like. How you talk to consumers and how you talk to communities about what that agency means for them and what that is as a part of, again, their value propositions is enabling your life. How do you want your life to be for you and your children, not only now, but in generations moving forward? What kind of impact do you want to have on you know, this climate emergency that we have? How involved do you want to be as a prosumer? I think it's for organizations like GNET and you know, the, um, I call them the, the witches of the CBGA, uh, you know, IAGA, NIAG, NAGA, yeah. NIAGA. Um, they're great organizations, it's not meant to be disparaging. No. But those sorts of organizations and councils <clears throat> really need to take an advocacy ownership 
um, and know that they actually have the power to put forward rule changes. They have the power to engage directly with their local MPs, actually with these regulatory bodies. Yeah. And, and just start moving forward with the process. So that's kind of really what Mark has just spoken about, isn't it? I mean, you, you're at the coalface of that with local communities. Yeah, look, I, I think that the key there, Stuart, is really um, knowing what it's going to look like in that sort of, that end game of, you know, 25, yeah. 30 years out, I think, that until you get to that vision. I think that um, one of the real challenging things at the moment is it's a lot of policy decisions, a lot of investment being made in things which are probably a little bit short-sighted. Um, I'm not part of government, and these are my private views, but, uh, and, but once again, I did work in the power industry for quite a while as well. But uh, if you look at the, a town, if you still think there's a need to maintain that web of poles and wires, yep. really you don't really want people disconnecting from the grid because you've got a network which still has to be maintained. Um, and put that in a water context, you know, we've got water customers and wastewater customers that are captive to us and, and with that um, we have a similar situation if uh, if we then had people just investing in their own water infrastructure and just uncoupling from them, it would just mean that we'd be putting more cost on the rest of the customer base. So once again, what does it really look like in the in the best investment scenario and, and with that um, ideally you have a communal uh, a battery that supports the poles and wires in the region provides that efficient balancing of the of the transmission network and, and, and demands on that transmission network. So you can effectively get uh, a good outcome which has got that long term. Then you can start building your regulatory framework around that ultimate goal. But until you start getting those sort of decisions which have really got that long term sight of where you need to be, uh, I joined the department in 1985 and uh, I remember um, having these books, which were um, effectively green books, I can't remember what they were exactly called, but how do we realise the potential of the brown coal sector, brown coal resource we had in the, in the Drove Valley? And there was all these uh, strategies about how you would effectively do that. Um, and if you go to the SEC, they would have seen by today that the, the Latrobe Valley will have been littered with um, brown coal generating units. Now, Things have moved on and, and we've changed and it's really getting that long-term view of where we want to be with renewable sector and, and moving forward that way. Yeah, so I mean, that regulation piece that just keeps coming through, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So, and I, I reflect on what you were saying, Sharon, in terms of trying to bring on these new qualifications. I mean, what are the regulatory barriers? Because I imagine industry Industry doesn't almost almost doesn't care about what the qualification is. Mm. They just want the arms and the legs, and they want mm. people who know what they're doing. Whether you're called a, a doctor or whatever, it doesn't really matter to them. Yep. I mean, what are the what are those barriers been like to navigate? Well, I think the the main barrier is that so for vet, it's um, ASQA, the Australian Skills uh, Qualification Authority, and as an institute, we must follow those regulations. So that means if you want to add a qualification to your scope of delivery, um, you need to meet certain requirements to do that. And if you're looking at something like the BZEE or the BST, which hasn't been delivered in Australia before, and it's not a nationally recognised qualification to start with, it's an industry qualification, it's really hard to move ahead and have that happen internally uh, because you're operating outside the system. But what I think is the opportunity there is for us as a dual sector and the other three dual sectors in Victoria is to, for the first time, genuinely come together and work directly with industry and develop hybrid quals. I think the VET sector is really good at the applied aspect and the higher education sector is really good at the academic aspect. But in saying that, I don't think either of us really come together and, and produce qualifications that meet the needs of industry but also strengthen the local communities. I think one of the ways that you could work closely with the communities for those that are kicking back is that if they could actually see an impact at the family level so they can see that their child or their grandchild or their niece or nephew is suddenly employed in gainful employment that hasn't required them to go off to university and get a huge hex debt or hasn't required them to enter into a traditional apprenticeship. They've actually been able to go into a hybrid qualification model and work 
at the same time and be recognised for that mm. is a real opportunity for the renewable sector. It's almost a Dorothy Dixer for you, Emma. How do we get community and industry and academia to work together in that space? I mean, that's, that is a bit utopian, but I, I think yeah. you're right. How do you, how do you show the benefits? It's, you see a benefit for your children. That's what motivates us all. It's an excellent question, um, and I did, uh, I actually took a photo of your wind turbine with the Venn diagram, who doesn't love a Venn diagram, um, particularly when it's got a wind turbine in the middle, but, um, and I think that is, that is the challenge, and nobody is doing it very well, uh, and I think that is, um, it's very difficult, um, industry can try and try it, but it's very difficult, um, because communities tends to be sceptical uh, of industry, even if uh, they are coming in with the best intentions. Um, and there's enough research to that. Communities tend to, um, you know, and they're not subject matter experts, we're talking about community at, at large, um, you know, they tend not to be subject matter uh, experts, or a few of them may be, or have some experience. Um, and peer-to-peer -peer learning is very uh, important for local communities, um, as is hearing from people that they tend to trust. Um, and the smaller the community, the more prevalent that tends to be. Um, so I think there is, uh, the, the big challenge uh, is for industry to partner with government um, and particularly community leaders. So when I, I use state government, I mean state government and local government. Um, and that can be challenging because uh, obviously they have stakeholders as well, particularly councillors. Um, but that's where a group like GNET um, becomes very, very important um, because it is made up of people that are known in the community with different backgrounds and it has a, it can play a role in bringing your fed unis and your industry players and your different levels of government to the table uh, and trying to find some common ground there to get the right outcomes. Yeah, well said. Um, I'll invite it up to the room. If there are any questions for the panel, please. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to ask my final question. Please. Um, so, this is an energy transition we're only get, going to get to do once. So, what does a just transition or a fair transition for the region look like for you? It's kind of my final question, but. Yeah. I take that question back. <laughs> just the capital of France. <laughs> I'll have a crack if you want. Yeah. Um, so, if we had, let's just use the $16. billion figure, uh, which I might it's not just the Grand Kids region, that's wider Western Victoria, so if you draw a line, obviously on this side of Bendigo, um, <laughs> and, and called that Western Victoria, uh, there's no one from Bendigo in the room. Is um, <laughs> I said that tiny check, we all love Bendigo. Um, so, I mean, there is, a, there is a large portion of that that is just impossible uh, to land in a region. It's just, you know, stuff. We don't have a steel manufacturer. It'd be great if we did. Um, for example, uh, there are some things that just will have to come in from overseas or from Melbourne. Um, but, you know, and it would be great if there was an, an aspirational target that, I don't know, just to pull the figure 15, 50%, between 30 and 50% of that actually did come from the region. Um, that those people, you know, we have a opportunity here and I um, was talking to the, uh, the JARA board, so that's uh, a traditional owner, JARA, um, that there is a opportunity here for traditional owners and um, same for communities, that normally it's a bit of a, a flash in the pan, you know, a big major project like a highway comes in, it's done, it's dusted and off you go. Um, we actually know this is going to happen, that it has to happen, that capital is going to be invested over a 10 or 20 year period, and we might miss the first project, um, but we should start planning and working with, you know, Fed unis and to mobilise and train up a workforce within the region for that 20 year spend. So where is, you know, work with industry, look at a transmission line, and a wind and solar farm, and, and what is the capital breakdown loosely between materials and labour and civil works and whatever, um, and start planning on what have we got here in the region, what can we, you know, where can we upskill our people, how many new people might we need to bring in, what would that mean for housing, like it's, it's a big job, but that is the stuff 
that um, the big industry does, whether it's being whether it's renewable energy or mining or transmission, there are teams of people, there are hundreds of people sitting behind the scenes working on these projects over years. They are the they're the numbers that they're rolling, putting the ruler over, um, and they will make decisions um, based on the information they have. And if a region can go to them and say, actually, do you know what we've got a plan here. Um, they will absolutely consider that and they will work with the community and prioritise that yep. um, over you know, bringing in resources externally if it is not substantially more expensive. So can I expand, I'm going to expand that question to the whole group. Um, what, and I'm happy with either a personal or a professional reflection, um, and I'll start with you Sharon. So what happens, what happens if this energy transition you know, if this, this kind of change, this infrastructure change is delayed. What's your reflection on that? Well, I think the industry itself is going to hurt even further because um, at the moment I already know that they're, they're crying out for, you guys are the industry, um, <laughs> is sitting on the education side of the fence. I know that there's a lack of local um, people available to go into these jobs. Um, which then means that uh, people outside the community are able to take the jobs up and whether they're transient or they're yeah. um, coming in from overseas, it's not building the community and the community see it as something that's happening to them and not something that they're working along with. And I think that just perpetuates the issue of them not seeing it as a value add. Yeah, mm. okay. If we delay this transition, mm. I'm going to look at it from a slightly different angle, and that's um, around fuel security. So I think we've all seen recently the impacts that the crisis in the Ukraine has had on fuel prices. And uh, I was recently in Europe for a conference, and I was so interested to see how many European nations were looking at Victoria and fluttering their eyelashes at kind of like, look at the renewables you've got, and you've got existing energy workforce and infrastructure, and you could produce hydrogen and, you know, both use it domestically, but potentially export it to the world. And that's not just Victoria, that's Australia sort of more generally. But what the opportunity we have here is to sort of decouple ourselves to a certain extent from the sort of pressures um, and constraints of international markets. If we're looking at literal fuel, you know, liquid fuels, that's very much on, a, on an international basis. If we've got the opportunity to produce a substance such as renewable hydrogen, where you just need renewable energy produced locally and a local source of water, you essentially have control of where and when you produce that fuel and how much and how you use it. And that, I think, is enormously powerful. Mark's got both. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's, he's got the dream. Um, seven years ago, I, I co-authored a report for the Victorian government on uh, fuel security, on petrol security. And at the time, we worked out that in Victoria, we had six and a half days, it was when we were ending refining, we had six and a half days of petrol in the state, and that included everything that was already in people's tanks. So it's not a great surprise, this stuff, but it does I seem to have... That yeah, yeah mm. it's really kind of stuck, stuck up on us. Um, can I, Rishi, can I give you the same, yeah. the same question? What happens if we, if we don't get on with this, if we delay this infrastructure? So I think, uh, for me, there are just two points that I want to make. One is um, um, the energy transition, uh, I mean, it, we all use the term and it's, um, you know, it's happening. We all saw it coming. It's the same, it's the same, it's the same situation, right? I think. It, Those headlights are getting closer. Yeah, exactly. So, so it, the, the, the exact, you know, I read an article the other day about, you know, the market failure that occurred, you know, last week. So many people saw that coming. They just didn't anticipate, um, you know, the Ukraine crisis, right? And Alistair mentioned it earlier, like, we're like three bad luck moves away from some pretty catastrophic... This is just going to happen. It's going to happen whether or not we like it. And the question for us as a society is how hard and painful do we want this transition to be? And I think, you know, turning it on its head to say, okay, so how do we look at the opportunity cost and turn that impact into opportunity? And that's what, you know, thoughtful planning does, right? So collaboration and, you know, future looking planning that's somewhat technology agnostic um, so that we've got these pathways ahead of us. We just have to get on and do it and start, you know, 
making the making the transition because otherwise it's just gonna you know it's gonna be a two by four to the face. The problem doesn't go away. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's a two by four to the face. It's not gonna be <laughs> that's, the, that's the quote of the day so far. Yeah, Emma, I think you'd answer but we've played six yeah. um, Oh no, I, I totally agree. I mean, the, the cold hard reality is that um, the cold is is going away, particularly in Victoria because it's brown coal. Uh, which has a low energy load and, and it's really dirty. Um, and it's, it's transitioning out and we have to have something to replace it. Um, so you don't have to necessarily be a rocket scientist to uh, look at that math and realise that if uh, that infrastructure is not built um, and there is not something else going into the grid, um, that bad things, really bad things happen. Um, and we're seeing that across the eastern seaboard now. And yeah. um, I don't think um, you know, it's probably something that uh, governments uh, of all persuasions and levels want to really talk about, um, but that is the reality. Um, there is a big change, and, and actually, we can't talk about it. We actually have to get on with it, which is going to make some, it's going to be hard. Let's talk more action. I like that. Mark, you're an action man. Well, momentum gathers momentum. Stuart, I think that's probably the yeah, yeah. once again. Nice. Yeah, I think the, the ball started rolling, and I think that um, if you look at it in the Victorian context, particularly, you know, Victoria has shown leadership in this area, <coughs> and, and it's been done in the vacuum of a national energy policy agenda. So the fact that you know it's it's had to challenge the way the market works, it's had to challenge the whole principle upon which a number of people think about energy in Australia, but. Um, it is, been, it is pushing forward. I think that the challenge for Victoria is probably making sure it's done in a way that's strategically visioned uh, and not necessarily you know, at the whim of you know, you know, the, the feel good of you know, those policy decisions that might be electorally sort of sensitive. Um, so those things like, um, so making sure we have a good understanding of where we want to be in 25, 30 years time, as I said, you know, if you go back 40 years. It's almost 40, like having a road map. Nearly, nearly 40 years <laughs> ago. There was a vision that there would have been all these brown coal plants, and that was challenged yeah. in, in the 90s. Yeah. And uh, when and gas was emerging, and not and, that long ago, yeah. and there was no longer a summer a winter peaking system; it was a summer peaking system. And and, and, and now, with the emergence of um, of renewable technologies, it's challenging it again. But it's having creating that vision, and once you get that vision, people will start working towards that. It's about creating investment, certainly, so that you can move forward. Well, that's a very nice, very nice line to end on. Um, can I say thank you to all of our speakers today? Um, I, I really like smart people, so it's fantastic to, to have heard all your thoughts today and thank you for sharing them openly and honestly and allowing us to record those and, and share them with a much wider audience as well is, is really very much appreciated. And I'll thank everybody here for dedicating their time today and also um, our team in terms of Tim and Michelle and Kylie and, and Aaron for, for pulling this all together. Um, very much appreciated. And uh, on that note, I'll call today to a close and, and thank you all and wish you well. Thank you very much.